Thanks very much, David. Um, what direction is the Dow Jones going to move in? How violent will the next BMP demonstration be? How many albums will Shakira sell? Will you have a moustache next week? These are the kind of questions, not the last one, that many of us in this room are trying to figure out. The kind of questions that we're trying to work out how to deploy big data to actively answer. And traditionally, we've attempted to answer these kinds of questions in quite set ways. We've looked historically at trends and tried to extrapolate forward. Or perhaps we've surveyed particular groups of people, carried out questionnaires or conducted focus groups. Or perhaps we've sought out opinions of experts in the field. And whilst, of course, these methods can yield sometimes reasonable results, they are often very costly and often far from perfect. Um, Shakira's first two albums tanked. Her third went triple platinum. Monkeys are better predictors of stock market movements than are investors weighed down, with, weighed down with historical analysis. And as for experts, well, given that most economists didn't predict the 2008 crisis and most Middle East experts didn't predict the Arab Spring, experts' track record at predicting the future, mm, pretty questionable. So, as someone who for some time now has been questioning and challenging the predictive powers of traditional forecasting models, I've become increasingly fascinated by the potential that social media has to improve upon these traditional ways of preparing for and predicting the future. And as a social scientist, and I think I'm one of very few here today as a social scientist, which is why I have paper rather than slides, I am increasingly convinced that my discipline has a real role to play here too. Because as more of what we think about, care about, like, want is put out there into the public domain and shared online with us by others, it's becoming increasingly clear that we have an unprecedented opportunity to listen in on the world in real time, in a disintermediated fashion, to browse rather than to search. And even though there are now, of course, increasing no numerous ways to collect data and collate data about what people are saying and thinking and feeling online, numbers don't always speak for themselves. Take a recent event here in the UK, a recent obvious intelligence failure that David's already referred to, the London riots. We know that since 2009, since the G20 summit, the police here have been gathering masses of social media data, collecting it, processing it, yet despite that, the police were, in their own words, overwhelmed by the chitter-chatter. How many millions of pounds were spent processing how many millions of tweets, and to what end, so that the police were always far behind rioters who had enough time to bag up their spoils in stores' own carrier bags before the police even showed up to where they were. Data here had failed. So was the problem that the police were not collecting enough data? Was it that they didn't have powerful enough computers um, that they were throwing at the situation? I think not. The problem lay in something actually more specific, their inability to explain, analyze, interpret this huge volume of data. They struggled to separate the truly significant from the insignificant, the 
struggle to identify the tipping points from the singular instances. The numbers weren't speaking, only shouting unintelligibly. So if we are to be able to use data effectively to help us make smarter decisions, predictions, and choices, we're going to need to understand what the data means, but also how it relates to the ways that we as humans actually act. Because when it comes to social media, we still don't know how buzz relates to sales. We still don't know how Twitter mentions relate to voting intentions. We still don't know how negative sentiment relates to violent acts. And until we manage to figure these kinds of relationships out, we won't really be able to realize the full potential of big data. And we've also got to work out how to then communicate these kind of insights effectively to those who need to act upon them so that we have actionable intelligence. This is why I feel that social media analysis cannot just be the preserve of computer scientists. To unleash the potential of social media data, we will need to not only train up computers to better understand language, meaning, sentiment, of course, big challenges in their own right, but we'll also need to develop methodologies and processes that will enable us to translate behavior online to behavior offline, saying into doing, words into actions, methodologies that are mindful of content, context, culture, and human behavior, and of course, also privacy, and this is an area where we as social scientists have had decades of experience. This is all the kind of work that social scientists such as myself, economists, behavioral psychologists, social psychologists, anthropologists, sociologists do on a very regular basis. And I call this bringing together this combination of computer science with social science, social data science. And to develop this approach, I've been working with, I've convened a team of leading social scientists, natural language processing experts, and computer programmers to work on, amongst other things, the nation's most watched and talked about currently TV show, The X Factor. Heavy social media usage across platforms, combined with a wide range of ages and social classes, combined with a public voting element, make this really research gold dust. And specifically, what we're doing is we're developing methodologies from social sciences and algorithms from computer science to test just how far social media data can predict who's going to get eliminated each week, can predict the eventual winner, and also developing methodologies so that we can improve upon the existing prediction models that are out there. And all the while, of course, we're gaining amazing insights into what X Factor fans like, think, care about, want. So whilst there have been, over the past year or so, a handful of similar attempts, mainly in the United States, to specifically predict the winner of reality singing contests, American Idol or America's Got Talent, in those cases, it was as if they thought that the data spoke for itself, that they could simply serve up the metrics and the results would be evident. But as they found, it wasn't that simple. And I want to quickly take you through just four reasons why this is so. First, language takes on its own meaning in very specific contexts and situations. So sentiment is often product or culture or age or content specific. The words a British X Factor fan will use to describe whether or not they like a contestant are actually different even to the words an American fan of the show would use. So 
whilst many companies ignore what we feel is pretty much a basic rule about language, what we've been doing is we've been developing X Factor, UK X Factor specific classifiers which um, are able to identify such terms as OMG, ream, fabulous, not, as very specific terms that our audience will use. And we're finding that we're getting much better accuracy when we're building very specific classifiers than using much more general ones. Second, your social media sample may not be representative. This, of course, is a real problem. People who use social media are not necessarily the same people who vote on the X Factor or buy a particular product. What social scientists call this is the sample frame. And any good statistical analysis will rely on a whole series of methods to try to ensure that your sample group actually represents the population you're trying to measure. Because, of course, without this, results can be extremely misleading. And I don't want to give away our secret source here, but we're developing a whole range of um, more accurate sample frames through cross-referencing data from different various social media sources and weighting them where we, where we can with appropriate demographic data so as to better represent what's happening in the real world. Third, human behavior is, of course, complex and, I would argue, non-linear. So, just because people tweet doesn't mean that they will buy what they tweet about, or in this case, pick up the phone and actually vote for Frankie Kokoza or Janet Devlin. So, what's the relationship between intention to vote and actually casting your vote? Is your Facebook like more aligned with intent, say, than your YouTube-like. We're collecting multiple data sets across various social media platforms to work out which are better at predicting votes cast. And we'll constantly be refining our weightings and our cross-referencings so as to improve our algorithms as we move forward. And fourth, to make sense of any of this, of course, one needs to understand the particular environment in which one's data is located. So in this case, we have to think about things like how does the way an X Factor contestant is built up or knocked down in the editing process affect whether an audience is likely to vote for them? How important are sympathy or polarizing candidates and how might language be specific to these? Um, if contestants are getting a bad rap in the tabloids, how does that impact the number of votes they'll garner? And what does the academic literature teach us about telephone voting shows? It turns out a fair bit. One study, for example, reveals that the order in which a contestant performs significantly affects how likely the public is to vote for them. And in case you're wondering, it's best to be first or last, which means I've drawn pretty much a short straw here today. We are constantly placing our results in the context of these sorts of insights. And we've gone live today um, in advance of tomorrow's first voting um, of the public for the X Factor. And if you want to keep an eye on what we're doing, do check us out on xfactortracker.com. But of course, this project is not really about the X Factor. It's about combining the skills of social and computer science to seriously improve upon social media analysis. Because metrics served straight up really only tell you that X was talking about Y. To put these facts into a structure for understanding and interpretation and apply our social data science approach of refined language, demographic weightings, ratios, context, and suddenly we're able to tell all these kinds of things about how groups react to a particular stimulus, how groups 
influence each other, how ideas spread, how ideas become influential, who is influential. Suddenly, our analysis becomes much more meaty and our predictions much more robust. Some of the other work others of my team are doing is of a more confidential nature, and I don't want to go into it in detail here, but just to say that we're applying similar sorts of techniques and developing similar sorts of strategies in such varied contexts as financial markets, polling, and public disorder, where we've actually been able to improve upon the police's estimates for marches of far-right extremist groups. It's quite incredible, really, when we think about this, this opportunity we now have to listen in on so many people, browse so many conversations, gather so much data at one time. But to make sense of it all, we're going to have to be able to distinguish the riffs, the melodies, the lyrics from what can otherwise be an overwhelming, cacophonous noise. By combining social science, the rigor, the context, the interpretation with the best in computer science, especially natural language processing, the potential just seems vast, a revolution in forecasting and intelligence gathering that, if realized, will help companies get products to market quicker, governments get better at predicting outbreaks of rioting and public disorder, help investors better predict market movements, intelligence agencies better stop terrorist activities, health authorities better predict pandemics and pollsters more clearly understand public perceptions and predict with even better accuracy. I feel so privileged to be able in my research and in my commercial work to be at what is really the cutting edge of this brand new discipline and to have been able to share just a little of what I'm doing and co-innovating and co-creating with my colleagues in computer science here in this room with you today. Thank you.